We've all seen the reports of floods in Pakistan, drought in Russia, failures in local infrastructure, and oil in the Gulf of Mexico. But behind the headlines, below the surface, the implications of these and other water-related issues present a mounting global challenge, which is as intricate as it is deep. Worldwide, over five million people a year die from lack of water, sanitation, and appropriate hygiene. Many of these are children. A dire statistic today, but in the year 2030, it is estimated that four billion people, or half the world's projected population, will live in water-stressed countries. Obviously, the demand for water is immense and growing, along with a thirsty and hungry population. Agriculture is by far the largest consumptive user of water worldwide. And this is no surprise when you consider that it takes almost 5,000 kilograms of water just to produce one kilogram of rice. As additional pollutants from agricultural runoff make their way into main water arteries, we continue to see dramatic changes in ecosystems and in the climate. Changes in precipitation pattern, especially taken in combination with glacial melt, are going to change the predictability and the patterns of our water resources. We'll see more frequent droughts in some places and floods in others. As this happens, other energy resources will be strained to meet the water pumping and transport needs. Today, for example, the water needs of Southern California consume about one-fifth of that state's power. And as we continue to soak up this precious resource, there could even come a day when water will become more valuable than oil. 145 countries share international rivers. Uh, the, this shared resource will either be a source of conflict or a source of cooperation between these countries. Global economic and political stability could very well hang in the balance. I don't think people understand how challenging it's going to be. I mean, we take it for granted that water is there, certainly in the United States, but in 10, 20, 30 years, we're going to see some shortages happening here and also the quality of the water is going down. Our challenges with water affect so many aspects of life here and abroad. And if we continue on the course we're on, the question won't be, will we run out of usable water, but when? And so, as Johns Hopkins scientists and policymakers, we work every day to determine how can we turn the tide in a different direction. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nick Jones, the Benjamin T. Rome Dean of the Whiting School of Engineering, and it's my great pleasure to moderate this panel uh, this evening. That video sets the stage for what I hope will be an exciting discussion about a truly important and challenging um, uh, global challenge for our community. It's not about H1N1, it's not about oil, it's not about health care or personalized medicine, sorry Bill. Um, it's not about the economy and it's not about energy, but it's about water. I am mindful of the fact that um, as we conduct this panel, we're presided over by um, some fa fairly important uh, figures. Um, our current president is here. Our first president is here on the right. Our founder is here. But perhaps even more importantly, with all due respect, in the top right corner of the right panel is a photograph of Abel Wollman, who is uh, one of Johns Hopkins' truly great sons. Um, and the founder of sanitary engineering. Um, and many of you know, made great, great contributions um, in, in this field. We have assembled this afternoon a, um, a terrific forum to, to take this uh, important uh, question on. There, there are three elements um, of uh, this forum this afternoon. First is the panel itself. Second is me as moderator. But third, and most importantly, is you as the audience. And so this is going to be an interactive hour, and we want to engage you as uh, much as we can in, into this, uh, this conversation. This, in fact, will only succeed uh, if we can get your, your active participation. My job is to facilitate that. There are three basic themes that we're going to try to address in this afternoon's panel. Um, one is the present, what is going on now. 
Second, the future. What challenges are we going to face uh, there? And third, what do we as a nation, as a global community, and as an institution need to be doing um, about this? But now, let me introduce our panelists. First, uh, on the left, Ed Bauer. Ed Bauer is an environmental engineer who also chairs the Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering in the Whiting School of Engineering. He is a leader in the study of water and soil pollution and treatment options, and his research provides guidance for defining and managing environmental risks and how to interpret human and ecological health risk data. To Ed's left, Kellogg Schwab is a microbiologist based at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, where he studies environmental microbiology and engineering with an emphasis on how pathogens exist in water, food, and their surroundings. He is working to develop new ways to make clean water um, available and affordable for less developed nations. To Kellogg's left, Winston Yu is an environmental scientist now at the World Bank, where he is a senior water resource specialist for the South Asia, Asia re region. He also teaches at the Paul H. Netzer School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. Winston has extensive experience working on technical and institutional problems in the water sector and has carried out projects and studies in countries including India, China, Pakistan, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh. And finally, Ben Zaitchik. Ben is a climate scientist who joined the Krieger School faculty just last year. Before that time, Ben was at the US Department of State where he was specialized in climate change issues in the Office of Global Change. So without further ado, let's move on to our first question. And that is the present. How bad is it? I think everybody got up this morning, um, turned on faucets in your hotel or your home, and water came out. So how bad can this be? We hear about, of course, isolated events such as um, the, the recent uh, Gulf oil spill. But how bad is this problem that we um, uh, are potentially facing at, at the current time? Um, as we're going to hear from the panelists first, but then when we go to uh, uh, Q&A, uh, we do have uh, people roaming the room with microphones. So if you raise your hand, if you have a question, um, please wait until somebody arrives with one of the microphones so everybody can hear your question. I think the, the, uh, the first person I'd like to go to to get some um, uh, the, the discussion going on this topic is uh, Ed Bauer. Ed? Thank you, Nick, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. As uh, Nick pointed out, we pro pretty much in the United States, we take it for granted that when we open our tap and flush our toilets that water is there. But we're starting to see a change, certainly as we look to the near term. And largely through human activities, we're going to see a lot more stress on water availability and water quality. And that's largely because of population increase and then urbanization. These are two big important drivers that are pushing up demand for water. And we're getting close to limits for our supply. And particularly in the arid southwest, we already know that. They've been dealing with this for decades in terms of how to manage their water. Uh, us in the east have been pretty uh, blessed with a lot of rainfall but we're even starting to see uh, stress situations. And so if you overlay maps on sort of precipitation and demand, uh, many areas are starting to have an equal demand and precipitation, which then in the future uh, will start causing shortages. But more importantly, we've learned to sort of view water now more holistically. And traditionally, we had water engineers and wastewater engineers, and they basically didn't mix very much. But we know from the water cycle that that's not a good uh, viewpoint because our water and our, that we consume eventually becomes wastewater and that goes into receiving water, which then becomes a drinking water for another city. And so they're really interlinked. And what we're finding, certainly in the US, is we have a lot of industrial chemicals, a lot of industrial pollution, and this is finding its way into water supplies. And so there are a lot of chemicals in water. And so in the near term, we're gonna, we see threats from these chemicals, we call them emerging contaminants. And that's my research area. I deal a lot with how to deal with these contaminants and what to do with them. So that's one area we're concerned with. A second one would be that as we try to meet our demand, we're using waters of more and more impaired quality, things like stormwater, agriculture runoff. These are all bringing pollutants into our water supply. 
And our drinking water regulations really develop for clean surface water. And as we start to recycle water and get these waters that are more polluted, then the current regulations are under question in terms of how safe is that water and, and, and what kind of risk it poses there. A third aspect has to deal with our infrastructure. And in a lot of the East Coast cities, we have storm events and we have our sewage collection and we call them combined sewers. And so what happens during these storm events, you have a big flush of water in the sewers and that bypasses the treatment of this water. And so a lot of untreated sewage can get into the environment. And particularly Boston, like Baltimore, a lot of East Coast cities, you have this combined sewer overflow problem and the decaying infrastructure, which is causing more pollution for that. And then finally, Mark, before I turn over to another panelist, would be in terms of your drinking water. And right now in Boston, for example, you're doing pretty well. You had some tr recent upgrades over the last 10 years uh, in terms of your, your treatment and quality. But one thing you don't do in, Bo in Boston, sorry, is you don't filter your water. And so for the moment, the water quality is sort of on the edge where you can get by with that. But in the future, as you get uh, more growth and more deterioration in the water quality, you're going to eventually have to start seriously consider the, the filtration process and not just rely on disinfection alone. So with that, I'll just give some opening challenges that we currently have in the US. And as we move forward, we're going to see a lot more stress in the water supply. Kellogg, um, perhaps you could uh, weigh in with, uh, with more of a global perspective on where we are. Sure. Uh, thank you for that, Nick. And it's a pleasure being here. Uh, every 15 seconds, a child is dying from a diarrheal disease, 1.8 million kids per year. Now, 30 years ago, it was every seven seconds. So we have some improvements that are going on. And I'd like to say that you know, the challenge is, is that, for example, one pathogen, rotavirus, kills 500,000 kids every year. But only 20 children in the United States die from a rotavirus infection. We have the technology to take care of these illnesses in the United States and high income countries. And it's a challenge to translate this to other less developed nations. And how do we go about doing that is, is something that we're working on. The United States. We pay about 0.5 cents per gallon of water, 0.015 cents per glass. In Ghana, where we've done research, it's three cents per glass of water, 200 to 1,000 times more expensive in other areas of the world. And the water they're getting is of questionable quality. We were in Ghana last month, a few months ago in the previous years. We've been there several years. And they serve water in sachets, small packets of water, 500 milliliters, about a glass and a half per sachet for about three cents or five cents. And they have different names of them. One of the names of the sachet I, I, I read was Trust Me. Or they have Trust Me water. We studied it. We tested it. It was loaded with E. coli and arsenic. These are the challenges that are faced the communities and their understanding. So how do we educate people? about the needs to have higher quality water. It is a challenge that we also tie in with engineering and our strong legacy with Abel Woolman, who provided us our ignorant blissfulness in drinking water in the United States. We expect it to come out of our taps all the time. We brush our teeth, we expect it to be clean. Many areas of the world, the water does not come out. And when it comes out, people store it. And when they store it, it becomes immediately recontaminated. So you can even have high quality water in treatment plants, but when it gets into the households and storage, it becomes contaminated. These are some of the challenges that are leading to the deaths. And most of those deaths, unfortunately, are in children and immunocompromised. So what are the things that we're looking at? The explosion of peri-urban environments is a challenge beyond imagination. Half the world's population now is in urban environments. And how do we deal with water, but also sanitation? Without removal of waste, you cannot have clean water. In addition to that, I'll leave you with two thoughts. The well, first one is water is heavy. It's extremely challenging to deliver large volumes of water throughout the world. We use over 500 liters per person per day in the United States, 1,000 pounds. Imagine a household of seven trying to get that amount of water per day. It cannot be achieved by carrying that water on the heads of the women and the children. Secondly, it's the young girls. We have to empower these young women to allow them to get out of that vicious cycle of carrying the water and having these problems in there. I'll leave you the final thought, as public health, we have to communicate. <coughs> Washing your hands is critical for every one of us, but making that communication link to others around the world is so challenged. We pull in the behavior people, we pull in the anthropologists and the policy people with the engineering and public health to work on this battle together. Okay. Thanks, Kellogg. 
Um, I'm going to exercise a little bit of uh, moderator prerogative here. We're going to go to questions on this, this particular topic, um, and I'm going to grab the first one just to get the ball rolling, and I hope it's a question that is probably on the tips of a lot of people's tongues here, and I'm going to direct this one specifically at Ed. Um, Ed, you've had uh, some involvement, I know, in uh, the aftermath of the, uh, the, the Gulf oil spill, um, and I thought you might uh, be, be interested in hearing from you um, a little bit about What's going on there? What, what is the prognosis for the, uh, for, for the Gulf? Um, and what sort of things are you in, involved with? Right, well, thank you there, Nick. Yes, so as Nick pointed out, my specialty deals with contaminants in water and particularly biodegradation of contaminants. So when the oil spill hit, actually 20 years ago, I worked on oil biodegradation at hazardous waste sites, so-called Superfund sites. And it was very natural then to extend this information and talk about the oil in the Gulf. And so Mother Nature has developed a lot of microorganisms that can biodegrade this material. So initially, of course, when the, when the spill happened and the, the well couldn't be capped off, there was all this oil spewing out, and that uh, was a tragedy. But as we now have learned, now that, that we've been able to cap off the well, that once we stop the source, that Mother Nature's done a pretty good job of degrading this material and will continue to do so. So these underwater plumes are slowly being degraded. There's some incident still. There's ecological damage, obviously, there that has happened and will still continue to occur. But Mother Nature has done a fairly good job of containing this spill, and it, biodegradation is continuing. OK, let's go to the uh, floor. Do I see some questions out there? Who's going to be the brave first soul? Here, right here in the. Um, I'm curious to know if, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I don't remember your name, but uh, the gentleman on the right, uh, you had worked with the State Department. I'm curious to know what is being done in foreign policy uh, forums now to kind of lay the groundwork for, um, I guess, avoiding war over water and other diplomatic problems over water. OK, thank you. Uh, I think that the answer is that a lot is being done. Uh, and one, one theme that we might discuss as we move forward this afternoon is the fact that water is certainly a source of stress and a potential uh, source of conflict. It is also an excellent uh, medium for cooperation uh, because it's an area where, especially in the situation of transboundary waters or limited water resources in unstable regions, where it's in everyone's interest to work together to understand that resource and to manage it better. And so, for example, uh, the U.S. State Department does extensive work, uh, as does USAID and as does the bank, which I'm sure Winston will talk about, working on transboundary rivers, aquifers, underground, subsurface water resources that cross boundaries to get countries to share information, to establish joint management uh, perspectives. And I'll, I'll just add that having worked at the State Department in an issue like climate, which unfortunately has come to be viewed as a bit of a zero-sum game and countries really bang heads about it, uh, the situation on water is quite different. It's an area where countries want to come together, want to discuss this, want to become more enlightened in, in how we address the issue. Can I add to that? Um, just to add to that, you know, I think one challenge, at least from a U.S. foreign policy point of view, is when to get involved. Um, I was at the State Department during the Iraq days when CPA was in charge. And I remember the Turkish minister had approached the, the, the State Department to help in mediating a treaty on the Tigris-Euphrates. So if you know the Tigris-Euphrates, it starts in Turkey and Syria and goes through Iraq. So Iraq is the downstream riparian. And at the time, our position was, well, you know, the U.S. is not a legitimate uh, uh, entity in the region. We cannot broker on behalf of the Iraqis um, a, a treaty amongst these three parties. That's very different than, for instance, the work that the State Department and the U.S. government have been involved with in terms of Mideast peace process. Mm -hmm. And that's something, you know, if, if there's interest, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, during the peace process, um, there were several different tracks of diplomacy happening. One of the tracks was to bring together technical specialists at the sort of water engineering uh, level. And even when at the political level discussions were falling apart, you still had quite a bit of engagement between the engineers from Palestine and Israel and Jordan, all talking together. And they would find creative solutions to meet to work on what is an inherently shared problem. So I think, you know, again, from the US foreign policy perspective, it depends on you know, where you're talking about. It also depends on what's, you know, the current geopolitical environment. So yeah, maybe just break from protocol one, one moment, given that we're talking about um, current water issues. We, we've heard from the, the panel about places where there's too little water, places where the water that is there is of insufficient quality. Uh, there's one place, I think, as many of you have seen in the news, uh, 
the last couple of days where there's just way too much water right now where it's not, not needed, and that's uh, Haiti. And I, I understand, Gail, that you have just been there and have returned, so if I may just put you on the spot, um, if we could have a mic up here, uh, you could maybe just uh, share some of your uh, uh, reflections on, on that trip. It's been a while since I've been cold called like this. <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, Haiti is a country where over a third of the people there have no access to clean water. And about 30% of the people there have no access to toilets or to latrines. And this was before the earthquake struck the country. So water is a huge issue. And a lot of it is water education. Ironically, after the earthquake struck and so many relief organizations are handing out water, a lot of the gastrointestinal diseases have gone down dramatically in that country. And now, as if this wasn't enough of a challenge, cholera outbreak happens. And we literally are going tent to tent in those camps, educating people on hand washing techniques, educating people on what it takes to stop the spread of these kinds of diseases. But you, you, your observation about turning on the faucet, you know, you, you come home from Haiti and it's almost a surreal experience. You go into your, your shower and there's just this never ending stream of potable drinking water. And it's something we all so completely take for granted. And it, it is such a luxury in, in a country like Haiti. And again, these relief organizations are bringing these giant bladders in several, several tons of water and breaking them down into those little packets you described. None of them were called Trust Me. But <laughs> nevertheless, um, this is, you know, the, the reason that Haiti has um, such fragile land is because people deforest the, the gorgeous rainforest there so that they can have charcoal to boil non-potable water so they can drink it. And that's why the island of Hispaniola gets hit so hard only on the Haitian side when there are hurricanes or earthquakes. And, and the other side, uh, Dominican Republic, they, they stand pat because the, the root systems aren't as compromised. So this is, based on what I've heard, it sounds like that is the future if, if we don't figure out how to get better potable forms of drinking water and how to share across boundaries. So. Thanks. Thank you, Gail. Other questions? Yes, in the middle. Oh, hang on, hang on. Let me, let, let, let's get a, one, one behind you and then you next, okay? Just once. I was just going to ask, so would it seem that the solutions to these problems would it be largely local solutions? Uh, the water being heavy, a surfeit of good water in one place, how can that be applied to help somewhere else? And how can it be uh, used for the economic benefit of a place with good water? I grew up in Ohio when the Cuyahoga River used to routinely catch fire. Um, Cleveland could use all the economic help it could get, and it seems to have an abundance of clean, now very clean, excellent water in the, the Great Lakes in general. Is there some opportunity there to help places that uh, perhaps need the water, um, or, or, is, or is it really a, a local issue? Kellogg, you want to take a first crack at that, or, or uh, Ed? Go ahead, Ed. No. I, I was going to say that, again, it becomes the, the cost of it. So right now, in the U.S., we really undervalue water, as Kellogg pointed out. I mean, our water bills are just dirt cheap. We're certainly willing to pay a lot more for cell phones and entertainment, and so, when water prices start to rise, then like in the Southwest, then you start to see conservation and other ways like desalinization taking over, which are very energy costly. And cost so, so I think a water rich area, there is no, not much opportunity to export that water until the cost gets so high somewhere else. So there's economic drivers for that. And so we have learned though regionally though, we can be creative about water transfers. For example, in the arid Southwest, I grew up in Arizona. Uh, you can actually uh, inject wastewater into groundwater and get credits for that, treated wastewater, and you can then pump up an equivalent amount of water in a different aquifer. So they're looking at this holistically and coming up with some really creative solutions to stretch the amount of water that's there. I'll follow up with just a, a succinct statement, hopefully. And one of the things that we're working on at Hopkins in engineering public health along with other disciplines is, is what we define as decentralized systems. 
with uh, the capacity to understand the communities themselves and what they need. So er learning from individuals is part of this process. And they have a long history there, but then also realizing that you're not probably going to get miles and miles, thousands of miles of pipes available in many areas of the world. So a decentralized, localized systems to start improving that quality of water, at the same time bringing in behavior education for sanitation too. They have to be linked together. And that's one of the challenges and what we're starting to understand is if you start with the principle that we bring everybody to the table to address these questions of behavior and education, we can actually start getting them to realize their own water needs. And it gets a little bit to that idea of the quality of water. Now it's hard to export and we, and we have a whole discussion on bottled water, but uh, these are some of the things we're working on. Winston, um, you made the comment in the video about uh, the role of uh, agriculture, and ag agriculture is, is a way um, by which uh, water is virtually mo moved around the globe. Uh, maybe uh, you have a comment on, uh, on that. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I work quite a bit in India and Pakistan, and there are places in India, for instance, where rice is being grown. Now, you know, rice requires a tremendous amount of water to produce. Um, and if you look at, let's say, a water budget and you ask yourself from an economic perspective, is this the best usage of your scarce resource? In a lot of cases, from the agriculture side, the answer is, is no. However, there is a good reason why India chooses to focus so much on rice production. That's because of food security objectives. Right? You want to feed your population. And their current policy is you know, we would like to not have to depend on other countries for our own food. Okay, so. I mean, it gets complicated, but certainly through the food lens, there are huge opportunities uh, to, if you will, rebalance the water equation. You know, you look in California and you ask in water scarce areas, should we be growing citrus? Should we be growing this one? We can actually perhaps uh, import it cheaper from other places. So it gets, it gets complicated and, you know, I think different countries have different objectives. Now, let's get back to this gentleman here. Here's a, here's a mic for you. Sorry. One reads about the privatization of uh, water management. Is there not a French company that uh, goes into relatively unsophisticated areas and pays a price and has the right to develop the water resources and make money on it? One reads about that from time to time. Is that an area of development that needs to be encouraged in certain parts of the world where technology is at a low level? Thank you. Winston, you want um, to take a first shot at that one? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, the privatization versus public debate, I, I feel personally it's gotten away from the wrong question. The more apropos question is, is how best do we deliver services to people? How best do we connect households? How best do we provide 24 hours, seven days a week service? In some cases, you have public utilities that are able to do the job. In some cases, you have private utilities that are able to do the job. In other cases, you have bad public utilities and bad private utilities. I think the example in Cuba, for instance, you look at the capital city there. There, actually, they have leased out the management of the utility to a private Spanish company. This is Cuba. Okay? <laughs> you look at, for instance, England, which is the most privatized of countries. There, they've actually divested all of the assets to the private sector. Here in the U.S., I think we're maybe 40, 60 percent private public. So, again, you know, whether it's private or public, from, from my perspective, gets away at the real question, which is how do we provide services? How do we bring capital into uh, capital, uh, uh, you know, into communities that don't have capital? Okay, private sector is notoriously good for bringing in capital and new technologies, but you know there are certainly examples where the private sector uh, doesn't function. So, um, you know, again, the qu the real question is is how do you uh, provide services, and what is the best model for that? Let me maybe take uh, two, two more questions on, on this theme, then we'll move on, on to the next one. Uh, actually, I'd better take somebody from the, uh, from the far side there in the, in the back. We will have some time at the end to come back and any questions that you have uh, left unanswered, hopefully, we, we will have time to address. Please. I just, I just had a quick question on desalinization. One of you gentlemen mentioned it, but you tucked your chin at the same time, so I didn't get your answer. Uh -huh. Desalination, um, it, would it work for, say, the two coasts of the country for agricultural, or could it eventually take care of all of us? Okay, so uh, desalination, first of all, we have a lot of water on the earth, obviously, all around us, but very small fraction, about a percent, is only available as fresh water 
to us, and so a lot of it is salty water. So desalination is being practiced in locations, but there are issues with desalination. It's very energy intensive. It's very costly to do it, and then you create a brine. So if we were to suddenly switch all our water resources, all our drinking water to desalination, we'll have a big brine disposal problem. So it's done on an isolated basis. It's usually done where there's no other water supply available, like Singapore. They want to be able to be water independent from Malaysia, so they've installed some desal facilities. In the Middle East, where you have warmer, a lot of oil money, I guess, that can pay for it, uh, they're installing it. Here in the U.S., it's very selective. Uh, we are developing the technology, but it's certainly not a panacea, and it's really it's so energy costly that uh, it, it is limiting its use. Maybe one, was there a question over on this side? Yeah. Not sure if this is a silly question or not, but um, do we know where all the water is in the world? Like, are there... Uh, if, you, if you didn't hear the last part of that question, it was, do we know where all the water is in the world? Are there potentially large, uh, untapped, underground aquifers that we're, we're unaware of? Uh, ben, um, you're probably the best person for this one. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of interest in that question. Um, and so... To some extent, we know where the aquifers are that are rechargeable, that are on you know, an annual or multi-annual time scale, regaining water from infiltration that we could pump sustainably, um, because we, we know where the variability exists on the Earth. However, there are large fossil aquifers, many of which we know about, um, that we just don't know how big they are and how, for how long they could be uh, tapped for water. It wouldn't be sustainable in a literal sense, because it's fossil water that is not being recharged, but if it's going to last a really long time, then it might be a reasonable approach for some water resource needs. A key example of this is the Nubian aquifer, uh, Nubian sandstone aquifer that underlies the countries of uh, Egypt, Sudan, Libya, uh, and I think it falls into Chad a little bit as well. Uh, so it's an enormous resource, very deep. And right now, uh, Libya has decided to start tapping that in a big way. Um, and they are withdrawing water at, at quite a rate from the Nubian sandstones. Uh, but the other countries are not. As you move towards the coast, particularly in East Africa, there's some thought there might be large aquifers there that we have not yet been able to detect. Uh, and so there are surveys going on to try to identify them. Again, those are not going to be sustainable solutions because they aren't going to be recharged, but they might be, they might be a stopgap. And so the, I think the, the summary answer to your question is perhaps, um, and we're, there are people looking for them. Okay, let me uh, move us on to the second theme for the, for the uh, session, which is uh, the future. Um, and you got a bit of a sense in the, uh, in, in the video that uh, there are some among us, uh, certainly this panel included, um, who are a little bit concerned about the prognosis for the, for the future. And we want to take a little bit of time to explore that. Maybe there are some, some stresses and some tensions now, but can they get worse? And there is even the um, intimation that perhaps uh, wars could be fought over, over water. And I think this is something that we probably very much... Uh, want to get a little, I certainly would like to get a handle on before I go to sleep tonight. Um, so um, perhaps uh, for, to, to introduce this theme, um, I'm going to turn to the, the, the two panelists who, who haven't um, uh, made introductory remarks yet uh, to, to Winston and Ben. So Winston, could you uh, perhaps share some of your uh, thoughts? Sure, thank you, Nick. Um, let me first start by saying, um, you know, rivers are political systems. Okay? And what I mean by that is the, the boundaries with which we as human societies govern often do not match the hydrologic boundaries that are governed by physics. Okay. Now, it is this mismatch, or if you will, the created interdependency that makes the management of shared water resources all the more challenging and even political. Now, this statement I'm making um, is actually nothing new. In fact, if you uh, look at the word rivalry, if you look at the Latin root for the word rivalry, rivalis, one who shares the same stream. Okay. Or if you look at the Chinese character for political, zhe, Okay, you look at that character, you'll notice the water radical there. Okay, so for human societies, for a long time, have known about this importance of sharing water, managing it, and recognizing the deep political nature of it. Now, in terms of what the future is going to bring, I mean, I think um, Kellogg and others have mentioned, you know, with growing pressures on this finite resource, with growing populations and the increased demands that come with it, whether you're a country, a state, or a city, Everyone in the future, I believe, will be striving to reach a water secure future. Okay? What I mean by water security is two things. One, to what extent can you as an entity maximize the constructive role that water plays in your society? So that's water for agriculture, that's water 
as a means to generate power. That's water for human consumption. And simultaneously, to what extent can you minimize the destructive role of water? Okay, that's floods, droughts, or other water-related disasters. In my view, in the future, that's where you know, the biggest challenge will be is, is how do you reach that water secure future? Now, let me conclude by adding an, ex an additional sort of geopolitical layer, and that's this idea of international rivers. As you saw in the video, I mentioned that there are 145 countries that share international rivers, okay? 145 countries that have an interdependency with their neighbors. And to what extent does that interdependency affect your ability to both maximize the constructive use and minimize the destructive use? That's a big question. If you think about the major rivers in the world, okay, Danube, 17 countries share the Danube. The Nile River, 10 countries share the, the Nile. Ganges Brahmaputra of Magna Basin, okay, over 300, 400 million people shared by six countries. Amazon, eight countries. The Rhine, the Zambezi, nine countries. And even here in the United States, we share rivers with Mexico and Canada. So clearly with these increasing pressures in the future, and increasing interdependence with your neighbors, um, I posit that uh, either international rivers will be a lightning rod for increased tension and conflict between countries, or as the empirical evidence actually shows, perhaps it could be a source of cooperation and increased dialogue. And so I think uh, from my perspective, that is one of the major, major issues uh, that the water community and human societies will face in the future. Listen, um, every now and again, I think we hear a little about, there's a rumor about climate change or something like that. Um, ben, does this have uh, any uh, role in this discussion? Uh, well, yes, uh, it does, absolutely. Uh, and I think that when we hear about climate change, most often people are talking about increases in temperature. So most frequently you say, oh, the world will warm by three to six degrees over the next hundred years if we don't do anything about our emissions of fossil fuels. And that's certainly an interesting number to think about, but it's not really what the relevant element of climate is for any of us. And it's not the relevant element of climate change. Uh, the kinds of climate change that really matter are changes in variability and changes in water. Uh, and in that sense, it's the variability and not the mean that we care about. And that's, that's not a new issue, of course. I mean, Winston uh, referred to the etymological background and how ancient these issues are in water. Um, we certainly know that when it comes to the link between climate and water, it, these are our most ancient stories. And you know, in, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, when the gods wanted to punish Gilgamesh, what they do? They sent a drought to kill his people, and they succeeded. Uh, the drought was devastating. We read the Bible. Joseph was found by his brothers in the land of Egypt. Why were they coming to Egypt? Because we're told there was drought throughout the land, but in Egypt there was bread. There was bread in Egypt because the headwaters of the Nile are in tropical Africa, which was not affected by a drought that had been impacting the Levant and other parts of the Middle East. And I think in all of our experience today, I mean, um, all of us, of course, will, will remember the, the devastating images from the early and mid-1980s from East Africa, the famine, that, that, the drought and associated famine there, uh, the oscillation between intense hurricane seasons and droughts in Central America that we've seen in recent years. And as was mentioned in the video, this, this past summer was, was an instance where you saw these extreme droughts in Pakistan, uh, droughts in Russia, and again, though it didn't receive as much media attention here, but severe drought in the Middle East and abandonment of farmlands in Syria and other areas uh, that is becoming increasingly severe over the past few years. And for me and for my colleagues at, at Johns Hopkins who study, study climate, a big question here is, okay, some of this we know a lot of from the past. How much can we understand this variability as it exists today in the absence of climate change so that we can predict more effectively, so we can build resilience uh, in our systems? And then to what extent is this climate change? We know it's a robust prediction. There's a lot of uncertainty in talking about climate change. One thing that's a fairly robust prediction is that some of the drier places on Earth, like the Sahel, like the Middle East, like some parts of su Southern Europe are going to get drier, while some of the wet places get wetter. How are you going to adjust to that? Another robust prediction, we're going to see an acceleration of the water cycle with more extreme events, with more variability. How are you going to deal with that in the context of the kind of political challenges that Winston was just discussing? As we plan uh, for water sharing agreements, as we plan for infrastructure required to provide uh, stable water supplies for the kinds of places uh, that, that Kellogg works? How do we deal with this increased variability? And I think that's a major challenge for certainly for us as researchers to understand, but more broadly for as a society, how are we going to cope with variability uh, as it increases over the coming decades? Thanks, Ben. Okay, keeping in mind that prediction is difficult, especially if it's about the future. 
Um, how about some tough questions for the panel? I think the, the questions we had before were great, but I think this, this audience needs to be tougher on our panelists, and I think this is a great place to be tough. Over here on, the, on my left. Just one second. Um, we read about desertification in China and droughts in China. Maybe Dr. Yu or Dr. Zaychik would have an opinion. How acute is the problem for China? Uh, well, I, I, I can say, I, I, in terms of China, so uh, we have one thing in common in China, among many things we have in common in China, we're both mid-latitude countries. Um, so when you talk about kind of the first order impacts of climate change, uh, we expect increased variability. So that, that's gonna mean, that can mean drought everywhere, right? Because even if you get more precipitation, if it comes in smaller, more frequent events, then you'll have longer dry periods, more evaporation. So China would be facing that in the same way as, as, as we will. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Things are bigger in China, as a general statement. And in China, you, you have a situation where they have a limited amount of arable land um, and so, relative to the population. And so you're going to have a situation where droughts there have larger impacts. One interesting response we've seen to this, of course, from China, but also from other countries uh, that are struggling with food security issues and perhaps water-related food shortages, is uh, land buys. Um, so uh, China, of course, is actively purchasing land in parts of Africa. Uh, as are some of the Persian Gulf states, as are other Asian nations, um, purchasing land where they believe that you can have productive agriculture that just hasn't been developed effectively. And so in countries like Sudan, like Ethiopia, like others, in, like Madagascar, you're seeing uh, massive, massive land buys by China uh, to try to, I think, temper against the climate impact, but also just a simple numerics of trying to feed China. Thanks. Another question right, right down here. At the risk of going from the sublime to the ridiculous, and I, I really appreciate the, the global perspective that you're taking, but I uh, chair a small or a planning board for a small town just north of here where we're under tremendous pressure to develop the, the small area that we live on, which is a part of the seacoast. And the pressure comes from the fact that we now have only septic systems in our community to treat our wastewater and largely, well, all of our water comes from wells, about 40% of it from uh, individual wells on individual pieces of property, and 60% comes from a privately owned water system. Uh, the pressure we, we face is that the people who want to develop our community and neighboring communities want us to do away with our septic systems, put in a regional wastewater treatment system, put a pipe out of Portsmouth, into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and dump all of the sewage in the Atlantic Ocean, treated of course, but, uh, but uh, to do that rather than to put it through our septic systems, have it go back and to recharge the aquifers so that the water is essentially some large percentage of it there available to be reused without any treatment other than what God made the, the earth able to do. Um, when you face, and I also, I think this is bringing this back to the, the United States where we take for granted our water, but we realize our water is under pressure in our area too. It's a finite resource. We also have companies coming in want, wanting to pump, pump the water out of our aquifers because it's very good water, put it in bottles and ship it all over the world, which draw, draws down the aquifers. And our water budget is clearly going to be under stress. Five or six years ago, we had major uh, stress problems with a drought condition. What, what advice do you give to us? I'm, I'm a great believer in the statement, if you can't do great things, do a multitude of small things well. Uh, so here I am chairing a planning board, been doing it for 10 years. We're faced with these problems. In, in order to make our small contribution to ensuring that in the United States, in our region, uh, we do have a continuous sustainable supply of water, what advice do you give guys like me? Thank you. Um, Ed, do you want to take a shot at that one? Okay, well, first of all, the, the, uh, I mean, you mentioned the septic tanks. Septic tanks, in essence, are trying to recharge water, but the Earth has a limited assumptive capacity. And so we found, depending on the receptors, I don't know what your receptors are in your region, what, if there are lakes that are being polluted by the septic or if it's just simply going into groundwater. But septic tanks don't take out some of the materials. So maybe in concept, it looks like you're getting recharged, but long term, you could have damage. So usually regionalization and sewage collection is a better way to go to safeguard the water. Now, ultimately, you could think about ways of not just discharging that water to, a, to the, say, the ocean, but use 
look at recycling that, using it for irrigating golf courses, for example, or, or using non-potable uses for that. That would be very creative then to look at that. Kelly? I'll, so think follow up on that would be tragedy of the commons. What our value of water is, is such that when it's something that one person is using, others are, are not conserving it, becomes this challenge in there. Decentralized systems have a place. There's no question about it. But, but planning and, and teaching the value of water is one of the things we have to do here in the United States. And it's, that's part of the long slog. Okay. Uh, question right in front here. <coughs> it's coming. Yeah, you can talk in this if you want. <laughs> To follow up on that, I was thinking about the um, uh, the cachet of bottled water in this country. And when you go out to a restaurant, they ask if you'd like still or um, sparkling. And all the bottling of the water and all the energy that goes into the, the production of the plastic or the glass and then the, the recycling energy and used to get that back or it's thrown away into landfill. And also... There's been some research done about the quality of the bottled water compared to the, the municipal water supplies, and often it's as, the municipal is as good or sometimes better than the bottled water. And it seems like this is a, a using up a lot of a very precious resource in a not very uh, thoughtful, uh, productive way. And uh, I wonder if you have some thoughts about education and, and, and just what you were saying about how that has to be changed, I, I would hope. Kellogg, I think I'd this is your take, I, I'm, okay. I'm a pro tap kind of okay, guy. Okay, you, you, know? uh, you have 90 seconds max, okay, because I don't want to push uh, Kellogg's Woman button Woman and Red's session. Woman, his son, promoted this around the United States, and we take it for granted. It is not to be taken for granted. Bottled water is not the solution. There is no way you can have 500 liters per person per day of bottled water. So anybody who says, I just drink bottled water, ask them if they've taken a shower in bottled mm -hmm. water. The energy consumption alone is, is that. What is interesting is bottled water has done a m wonderful marketing campaign. And what we have to do as a society is to realize what we have taken for granted cannot be taken for granted. And we have to not fight back, but be strategic partners with that. And the understanding and communication goes to the kids and those things. So I'm going to take a sip and stop. <laughs> Winston. Just to add one thing to that, um, just so everyone knows, you know, the standards with which uh, our drinking water is regulated by is EPA. Drinking water is not regulated by the EPA, it's regulated by the FDA. Bottle. Bottle, the bottled water industry, yeah. So, and if you look at the standards, I think you can probably guess which way the standard is more strict. So. Okay, uh, let's see, I better take one uh, in the red over here. Hang on, right behind you. I know a lot of our water use um, is uh, used in agriculture, and a large part of the water used for for, ag for irrigation is lost to evaporation. And I was wondering if the more widespread use of drip irrigation is something that, that could be done through changes in laws or is it just a function of charging so much for water that people will have to use drip irrigation? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, in the work that we are doing in India, um, it's Pakistan, Bangladesh, we are very heavily uh, promoting drip irrigation. Um, you know, I think often in the water discourse, we often are talking about supply and how do we improve our supplies. But there's the other side, which is the demand side. And to what extent can we conserve and, and get more per drop? Okay, so how, how can we produce more economic value per cubic meter of water? And drip irrigation, amongst other new technologies, are a fantastic way to do that. Um, you know, there are, of course, barriers in any country you work with to drip irrigation. You know, uh, you have farmers who are used to, uh, let's say, pumping out of a groundwater well and are used to flooding uh, their land for rice. These things take time, and it's, it, part of it is an education and awareness building uh, effort. Can I, okay, anything, anybody over on this side with a question that I may be missing? Oh, I just want yeah, to add something. Very, sorry, very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, just, to, just to build on, on Winston's answer to that. So uh, uh, my group's done a bunch of work in the Euphrates River. And if you add up the current plans of the three major riparians, there are Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, if they really could do all the irrigation they want to do, it adds up to about 150% of the water in the river. Um, that's if you are assuming traditional flood-based irrigation. We did a study looking at what would happen if you actually converted a significant proportion of that to drip, and suddenly it becomes actually a feasible possibility 
now. It's just a study. There's a lot of work. Folks at the World Bank have to think about, well, what does that mean to implement? But absolutely, the potential of drip irrigation to uh, avert some of these, these coming conflicts over water, I think, is enormous. Okay. Um, I better get somebody over here on the, on the right. As a university, how does Hopkins make its impact known? Actually, can I, can I just sure. take a table that question just for a moment? Because we're going to come back to that, that theme in just a, a few minutes. So if I can table that, we, we will address specifically that issue. OK? Uh, there were uh, perhaps down there on the, uh, on the far side. Yeah, right. Oh, sorry, in the middle here, right. So I have a couple of questions, but I'll let you decide if I have that luxury. Uh, first of the gentleman from environmental engineering, you mentioned that uh, in the Gulf with the oil spill, uh, that Mother Nature was doing a pretty good job of uh, cleaning that up. Do we have a time frame estimate of how long before that water quality is back to where it was before the oil spill? Let me just point out that the, uh, at this point, things are pretty good down there. Although you're hearing reports about, again, a regional aspect or small local hotspots. But uh, I, I, my sense is going to be in, in within a few years, as opposed to sometimes decades. Like in Alaska spill, you could go up there and find a lot of tar balls left over even a decade later. But this one is turning out right now that because it's in the Gulf, it's warm. There are a lot of microbes that are enrich enriching, finding it. I, I suspect in, in a few years, we're going to see almost no traces of, of the oil that was leaked. Okay, uh, back here. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, by the way, for bringing an academic reunion to us. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm coming from uh, expected ignorance, which is what happened when I sat in the classroom years ago. <laughs> now, now, most of, uh, most of the, the, the premise seems to be, you know, in most of this discussion, that there will be uh, too many people around, and therefore the shortages will be more important, um, and certainly the variability issue aside. But um, there have been some um, uh, articles that's, that say that world population will actually peak in the latter part of this century, um, largely due to various changes in, in um, uh, family patterns. So I wonder if there's any... Uh, any, any uh, truth to this or any accepted truth to this, that is that the population expansion is not infinite, but rather quite finite, uh, and that how that might affect uh, these issues that have to do with water. That's an easy uh, one. Who wants to take that on? Kellogg, you want to I'll uh, start in the public health, from the public health aspect of that, that, that population control is critical in these things, which goes to education, which goes to empowerment of, of societies and, and predominantly women on their reproductive rights and the understanding of that. But what I'd also like to mention that is that the population expansion, which may decline, there is a change and shift where the very poor, the bottom of the poor, a billion people are moving into cities, which therein lies the problem of how do you get the water and sanitation along with the other needs of these large mega cities to fit into any kind of plan. And that's part of the challenge that maybe we'll talk about in the next section. It's not as easy. So, others? I'm just going to point out that you know, population may level off, but a lot of the world's population wants to have a lifestyle like we have or moving that direction, and that co has a lot more water demand. So even if we stayed level, the demand for water will continue to go up as these populations go from a vegetarian to a meat diet and industrialize. Okay, so let me, oh, Ron, please. Thanks. I, th I think this question is probably for uh, Winston to start, at least. Uh, to, you know, to the extent that you tell a story about water as a scarce resource being a source of uh, conflict among competing users, societal users, that has been with us uh, for millennia, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, to the extent that we ex expect that the pressure on water is going to become more rather than less acute in the years to come, what's, what's the takeaway for an appropriate international governance arrangement to deal effectively with these contentions. Um, you know, is this, is this done regionally? Is it done globally? What does it look like? And who are the right players that need to be there? So it would be good to have a sense of what the optimal looks like and what you think ultimately will be politically feasible to address this. Okay, wow, that's a, uh, <laughs> that's a big question. 
Um, I see a few things. One, you know, it's interesting if you look at the historical record of reported conflicts around water. There's only one recorded case, and it goes back to, you know, ancient Mesopotamian times, and it's between two village states in what is now southern Iraq. Okay. Uh, since then, up to the present, there have been thousands and thousands of treaties signed between countries on a bilateral basis or a trilateral or multilateral basis on the issue of water. Um, if you look at international law, most of what governs international law in terms of the water is customary law. So it's basically you know, ideas of prior rights or do no harm. They're sort of the two main uh, themes that you see in a lot of the treaties that are signed between countries. Um, now, the UN has tried uh, over the last several decades to pass a, a sort of a, a convention, much like the IPCC convention, on water. And it's no surprise if you look how many people have signed and who have actually ratified. My view is that this is probably not going to go nowhere. I mean, for instance, if you can guess which types of countries are the ones who do not sign. These are typically the countries that are upstream of the rivers, okay? It doesn't take, you know, a, a political scientist to really understand the forces that are at work here. Uh, so, you know, I, I think right now, um, you know, I think there is a lot of rhetoric in terms of the, fu the, you know, the future wars over water. And I, and I, you know, in my class at SICE, you know, I, I hope to dispel that myth because I actually think that water actually is more of an opportunity to bring countries together. And this is why, you know, at the World Bank, for instance, we are leading a big effort in the Nile to try to encourage dialogue. We're leading a big effort in the South Asian countries because many of us believe that this is an entry point into dialogues beyond water alone. Again, in the Middle East example is, is such a good example where, you know, even if the, at the political level things are falling apart, people will always talk about water because it's a shared interest. And the theory and the idea is that this can, this happens all throughout. So, you know, as Mark Twain says, you know, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. Well, it's true, um, but I think it's also, you know, people will come together over it. Okay, I'm going to move us on to the, to the final theme, um, and we are um, a little limited in time, um, which is uh, what, what can be done. We've been, things have been a little bit pessimistic, maybe a hint of optimism there towards the end. Um, but uh, what, what can we do um, regionally, uh, internationally, uh, and what can what should Hopkins be doing? So this comes back to the question you asked before. So I would invite um, each of the panelists maybe to just um, in, a, in, in 60 seconds or so talk about um, initiatives that, that each of you um, either have underway or see as possibilities for Hopkins' role uh, in particular uh, in addressing some of these, uh, these challenges. Um, actually, so Kellogg, let me start with you um, first perhaps. Thank you, yes, and it's an exciting opportunity. We've developed a global water program through the initiative of the President's Office and the Provost's Office to link together all the different disciplines at Johns Hopkins University. Our strengths have historically been engineering and public health with the strong marriage there, but what we've come to understand is we need the behavior side of things, we need the economic side, the policy side, the anthropologists, those in there to get the understanding of how we can drive change. Because what we've been doing for the past decades has not been successful internationally and sometimes in the U.S. So it's not an us versus them. It is a we situation that we're facing in here. And part of the Hopkins Initiative is both domestic and international to pull people together across disciplines. Now that's called herding cats. It's extremely challenging because we talk different languages. We have different things. So we're driving towards research proposals that allow for this funding. One of the challenges we face is that that's not an individual funding agency. NIH will not fund things that are done necessarily internationally. International USAID won't fund things that are in public health. So we're trying to bridge this by leveraging funds and availabilities to really push this forward. So that's part of our challenge and what we've been doing. Ben, you got anything to add from the uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think there's an enormous amount of opportunity uh, in that field as we move forward in our understanding of the water cycle and, and its impacts. Uh, we're also associated with the Global Water Program that Kellogg just mentioned, and that's been a very exciting opportunity. Uh, I myself am involved in the project of the Nile, working quite closely with Ethiopia. Uh, one thing Winston mentioned is, is the regional element of, of water sharing. You also want to think about in any river basin, where does the hegemon live? Is it a downstream military power or an upstream military power? Uh, in the Nile, it's a downstream military power. Um, working with Ethiopia on effective development of that 
understanding how climate variability will influence erosion and, and water dynamics in one of the water towers of Africa, the Ethiopian highlands, gives us a huge opportunity to improve livelihoods there and to improve the use of water throughout the basin. And I think that at Hopkins, where we bring together the plant, earth and planetary side of that, myself with, with looking at the, uh, at the dynamics of the climate, with the public health, with the engineering solutions, is really a great place for us to contribute. Winston, roll for size, perhaps? Yeah, I, mean, I think two, two things I would point out. Um, you know, as an engineer by training, and I can't believe I'll say this, um, you know, we can design systems that will work perfectly. Okay? But we cannot tell you how humans will interface with that. And so from the size side, I think, you know, one of the things we really are focused on are sort of the institutions and policies that are required to enable the services that you want or, or, or you know, whatever your outcome is. So that's the first thing I would say. The, the second thing I, I just want to point out in terms of a broad uh, Johns Hopkins view is the, the role that, it, that technologies can play in the water issue. Um, you know, I've, I've worked, you know, 15 years in Bangladesh, and one of the things that I've seen there is how pervasive mobile phones have become. And that one technology has made a huge difference in terms of alerting populations about floods and cyclones. Okay, so I think, you know, there are technologies like that um, that give, a, give countries huge opportunities to leapfrog and to, again, as I said earlier, make them more water secure. Okay. And uh, Ed. Yeah, thank you, Nick. So our, our department was founded by Abel Woolman, as has already been pointed out, and we continue his legacy really in terms of research and his vision. Uh, we're a very interdisciplinary department, and so engineering has a role to play in solving our water problems. We're working on new technologies like better membrane systems, way to recycle water, my research, and looking at biodegradation of contaminants and stretching our available supplies. But we also work very well collaboratively, and this global water program is we're part, a part of that. We also have social scientists. So we know that we can't solve the water problem with technological solutions alone, and so we do need uh, the social science and cultural aspects to be considered so that we do have a better mindset and we do protect this valuable resource. Great, thank you. Okay, we've got time, I think, for about three or four questions to wrap up right here. With regard to behavioral paradigms, uh, I work in industry, and over the last 30 years, you've heard a lot about conservation of energies, and a good parallel here would be the conservation of compressed air. Most people write it off as not being that expensive, but it's a fortune to produce. With regard to water and the infrastructure in this country, how much of it's actually wasted from leaky faucets and from people that don't really think it's that costly? Do you remember? I, I, Kellogg, is that your, uh, up it your alley? It, it, uh, so water wastage in the United States, it, it ranges from 25 to 30 percent in major cities of water loss through aging pipes. It varies. East Coast, there's a lot of older pipes. Boston, for example, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., those numbers could be even higher. So that's a, a first thing is that we could be smart on our conservation. The other thing I'd like to say is that we can also have better technology. What Hopkins is doing is driving some of these technology uh, avenues to address just those needs about how you would conserve water within a system, changing pumping dynamics and things like that. Energy, 10% of a city's water, energy is for water. So these are part of the smart solutions that we're coming up with. Anybody in the back? I don't want to always, uh, yeah, right in the back in the middle there. When we hear about these environmental disasters like Haiti, um, what successful interventions are there is possible? So there's a cholera outbreak and dirty water. So you hear um, educational um, interventions, I guess, providing clean water. What other things, because a lot of times you hear the problem, but you never hear the solution or what, it, what happens. What, what successful interventions have there been? I'm happy Sounds to like you again, Kellogg. I, I, I love it. This is great. <laughs> um, we, we, at the Global Water Program, we're developing what's called a disaster thrust, which is the response is designed before the disaster. And this sounds self-intuitive, but it's really not been there in many instances. So one of the things we're trying to do is have an evidence-based approach to what shows success. Many funding agencies and non-government organizations will throw resources at a disaster and then leave a few weeks to months later. We saw this in Bandeache with the tsunami. We saw this uh, more recently last time with, with the issues that went in Haiti. What we're proposing and what we're starting to do is from the beginning, a component of that response is a response to the evaluation of what's going on. This is independent from those meeting the needs of the, of the, of the critical situation. 
But the challenge is, is get the agencies to understand that the research that's involved in that is a positive thing so that the funding goes into this development as well as an understanding. To answer your question about what has worked, what I know has not worked is when you throw a widget into a place without education. The classic example is those interventions where there's pretty complex way to do it and they don't teach the people. They just drop it on the system and it will fail. And that's been shown. So the successes are those that are, are people there continuously re-educating the individuals even after the disaster itself. Right. Two more questions right here. Yeah, with regard to all the good work you're doing in the area of uh, water resources and climate change, um, I'm wondering to what extent uh, you've been able to maximize your impact by collaborating with other universities and a lot of the big nonprofits that are doing work in the same area. Uh, Ed, do you want to, can, can you provide some perspective on that? Well, I, I do think that if you think about how gl climate change is, is impacting water supply, particularly the warming, you're going to see a deterioration potentially in water quality because of growth of algae and other forms in our water supplies. And so again, we're being proactive in terms of the treatment technologies we are developing and also taking a systems approach. So that we, I talk about water cycle engineers as opposed to just a water treatment engineer and a wastewater engineer. And so we can think more holistically a, a in the future as we have this variability and the temperature rise, which invariably will, will lead to more water quality deterioration. And engagement with other, uh, with other institutions. That's true, uh, right. I, I'll add one thing to that. For example, the university consortium that we've developed, and I'm, I'm part of the lead on that, is WASH, Water and Sanitation Hygiene from the university level, where we have Hopkins, Stanford, MIT, Yale, Duke, Michigan, coming together to address the issues that an academic institution can bring in to this non-government organization and these governments there. It's a different spin. It's a different perspective. We're research-based. We're evidence-based. We have the independence in many instances. We don't care how that one system works or not. We care about the principles behind it and how that's going to drive change. And that's some of the things we're working with in a collaborative effort. Last question from the left-hand side there, right over here. I wonder how much of a challenge the um, natural or the cultural foods are. You were mentioning rice as being something that's particularly water intense. Are there foods that can be promoted in uh, certain parts of the world that would be more conservative? Winston, you want to take a shot at that? Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> yeah, certainly um, in parts of India, for instance, uh, you know, we're looking at, you know, instead of the traditional, rice, the, the traditional rice and wheat system, maybe moving to higher value crops. Um, because if you, know, if you look at how much rice is being grown right now, um, a lot of it's being grown because of weight, because currently you don't have storage to maintain it. And so you know, you're growing actually more than you actually need. Um, so you know, you know, the agriculture bit is, is complex and there's a lot of things happening, but certainly, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, of sort of new crops and sort of higher value crops that we're promoting ourselves to try to increase incomes uh, with uh, sort of marginal farmers. Okay, unfortunately, um, our time has uh, come to an end and we do need to stop. I know that there are many more questions out there. I must say that uh, just before we began the, uh, the panel, um, I had that concern that one often does as a, as a moderator. What if we give this panel and there are no questions? Um, but, of course, yeah, I was foolish to think that with, uh, with the typical Hopkins audience. Um, we never need to worry about that issue. And, and so uh, this group, of course, has not disappointed. So... Um, Please join me uh, in thanking the panel uh, first. Thank you. And uh, let me close by um, thanking you all for your uh, participation in making my job easy. Um, and so I think uh, we should give, give uh, all of you a hand as well for, uh, for a great session. Thank you.